you've landed inside Launch Street, the business innovation podcast, where we interview top innovators out there shaking things up so you can innovate, differentiate, and get further, faster. Since you're here, we know you're the type of person that recognizes the importance of unlocking your innovation advantage so you can compete and win. And now, your host, the person that has worked with leading companies like Disney, Procter & Gamble, Aero Electronics, the U.S. Army Research Labs, and Red Robin on upping their innovation advantage, Tamara Gontor. Hey, Launch Street, Tamara here. I've got a question for you. If you were to play that kid's game, tug of war, with a rope, and on one side, you had all the resistors of change, like they were people, and on the other side, you had all the drivers of change, like they were people, which side would win? Every person, team, organization has resistors and drivers of innovation that are creating a tug of war in your daily work and in your business. Now, here's the thing. You'll never get rid of all the resistors, but the key is to have more drivers than resistors, to pull that rope towards innovation, growth, and progress. So I just did a burst of innovation live video on this. You can see it on our website, go to launchreet.com. We'll put the link to the video in the show notes where I talk about what are drivers and what are resistors of change, of innovation, and how do you get more of the drivers of change? Of course, the first thing to do is to recognize them. But go check out that video and that blog because you'll learn more there. But I want you to think about that tug of war and where you have either of those and what side is weighted with more of them. Okay, on today's guest, have you ever noticed how some people, maybe it's you, are brilliant at your job? So you get promoted to a leadership role. Yay! But you aren't given any real training on how to lead, so you struggle. By the way, this is nothing against you. Leadership is not an inherent skill. It is learned and trained. And this is why I wanted to have on Krissa Zindros Boyce on the show. She talks about power shifting, figuring out your leadership brand, and the importance of having a D-R-E-A-M, a dream. Krissa has been a consultant, executive coach, and educator with the Handel Group since 2009. Her clients, an international group of serial entrepreneurs, perennial corporate executives, and established individual contributors, hail from a broad range of sectors, including finance, legal, media, entertainment, fashion, technology, and government. So she's got some really fascinating and I think broad experience to pull from. She teaches her clients how to define their leadership brand, strengthen their competitive edge, and foster relationships that impact the bottom line. What do you say we dig in and become stronger leaders together? Krista, thank you so much for joining me today. I have a feeling this is going to be a lively discussion. Thank you very much for having me. I have a feeling too. (laughs) So what's your first memory of being innovative? So it's not necessarily a first memory, but it's one of the very first memories when it comes to me being in the workplace. And so um, very early on in my career, you know, when I first landed that like big job, I was leading a team, I had a nice title after my name. I was working in a visual department for a retail company, which meant I was in charge of ensuring that all the visual merchandising and what the company wanted the stores to look like were intact. And so one of the things that I noticed very early on in this role was that there were many processes that were not working very well. Wow. And specifically, yeah, specifically there were things like we would plan in the office and then I would go to the stores and we would look at how the stores were executing what we wanted them to execute and it was taking them way too long. And specifically, whenever we had sent them product to put onto the floor, you know, our sales would go down and they would use way too many payroll hours. So after kind of sitting back and watching this process for a while, I realized that we in the office had a lot of work to do in terms of making sure that the process that we were telling the stores to use to execute was efficient so that we could make the most profit and be smart about our use in payroll dollars. And at first pass, you know, being a young leader, I was like, okay, everyone's going to want to do this. They're going to champion this. It's obvious. It's obvious. And no, it was not obvious. Because when I presented some ideas around how to streamline processes both in the office and out of the office, um, it was actually really shunned on. So it was my first time really understanding how corporate culture 
causes innovation and the various roadblocks associated with bringing ideas to the table and how to champion them and get people on board and influence and like prove the ROI over time so people want to invest in your cause. I just want to interject and say, I have to say that I'm thrilled that you shared that story because I think, uh, and I talk a lot about this in my work too, that, you know, there's kind of, the innovation's a marathon and there's two sides to it. And one side is, you know, coming up with that new solution, that new idea, that new way of thinking. But the other side is getting people to buy in. And so often we think the idea, kind of like what you were saying, stands on its own. Like, don't you get it? It's obviously going to make this better. We won't lose sales for those weeks. And we still don't get buy in. And then we leave so frustrated that nobody listened to us. And we're over there like, oh my God, it's so obvious. Now, did you ever get buy-in for that? Um, so it actually took about two years wow. to get the buy-in. Yeah, and I really kept championing it because um, it was a clear dip. Like every single month, the third week of the month, there was a dip in sales mm. and everyone complained about it. And that's when it. they were supposed to put new stuff on the shelves. Yes, exactly. Uh, and then that's when we had like the big um, kind of delivery of shipment. And, you know, everyone complained about it. And I would be sitting in these meetings and they would look to me and go, how come this happens? And I would reply back with, we need to change the process. And they would say, <laughs> well, no, we don't really know about that. Maybe we can make it easier for the stores. And I'm like, I'm saying the same thing, but we have to look at it from the ground up. We can't just change one piece. We have to do an overhaul. Uh, so it really, it's interesting. Humans don't love change. And even when something is not working, they feel really comfortable yeah. in the not working of it Comfort all. Comfort is a big pull. Yes, very much. So over time, I kept, I just kept being very annoying, the truth is. And anybody who would listen to me, I would say, can we try? Can we try? And over time, what I started to do was work with different facets of the business and make micro changes. So for example, one of the things that happened, in, especially in retail, is when you uh, de develop clothing, everything you put into a garment costs money. So if something came in on a hanger or came in with a sticker or you know some tag on it, it, it adds to the garment cost, which means we have to sell it at a higher rate. So one of the things I did really early on is work with the buyers to say, hey, I can tell you which pieces of clothing we're going to keep folded that don't have to come into a hanger. And they were more than happy to do that because they had to go through a laborious process of marking which item had to be hung on a spreadsheet and sent into the factory. So I would sit with them and tell them what didn't need the hanger. And it saved, while it doesn't seem like a big deal, a penny per garment. Wow. And we did that the first season. That's actually big, yeah. Yeah, when we did that the first season, there was like a, like a quick, immediate kind of you know, response in the business. We Everything came in at lower cost. We were able to sell it at a higher margin. And people were happy. And this little micro change allowed people to go, okay, like what else can we do? But it really started there. I had a huge process that I was clear on what I, what I wanted it to be, but being patient and being willing to kind of, you know, follow the, the different paths and the detours, I think is what led to that being a successful process rollout. So in the end, we completely overhauled how we did all of the work that we did. Basically, the process from the time we bought a garment to the time we sent it to the factory to the time it hit the stores completely changed, which I'm I pretty proud of. You should be. That's, that's awesome. And I want to dig into one thing that you said that I just kind of wrote down and highlighted because I think it's really important. And um, I just finished my book. I wish I had this story to add into it to this one part about small steps. I have a great story in there, but this is it's kind of exactly this concept. I want to ask you about micro changes because I think one of the challenges we have as innovators, um, regardless of what t style of innovation we are, is that we tend to want to leap. We have the solution in our heads. We think about it. It's, it's what's on our minds. It's the thing that we're excited about. So we get the vision, you know, a hundred steps down the road. But sometimes it takes those little things to get us there, kind of these little baby steps, or as you called it, micro changes. How did taking that type of mindset or that approach change how you, how you did things and how you thought about getting buy-in? So for me, it really was I wanted to impact various parts of the business and because I, so I was sitting in a very special role where I was almost a, the liaison between the corporate team and then the field team, the, the people who worked in the store. That was really my job to kind of communicate to both sides. And so for me, it was important that if I could make any little change and help anybody out and take away one little complaint, I would feel pretty accomplished about that. Um, but really, 
what I started to notice, and as I kind of sat back and watched the leaders who were successful in the company, what I noticed was that they weren't pulling people along when they had ideas, and they weren't forcing the issue, but they were doing small nudges, and they were really willing to walk with people. And I, and I see this now in my coaching too. I have a lot of leaders who have big ideas, who want to change something, who want to roll out a project, and they're ready to go. They have a vision. They're excited. But, you know, they get kind of, they, they jump the gun and then they're, what they, what they miss, what they lose in the population that they're trying to inspire to go along with their dream or their vision is people don't really understand it. And they haven't, had the, they haven't taken the time to really walk them through and help them understand what, what's in it for them. And human beings really care what's in it for them. And so... What I learned watching other people was I really do have to tailor this to my audience and make it about them. And so whether I was sitting with like an allocation team or a buying team or our CEO, I, I would always consider like what's in it for this person. I, I want there to be a better process so it's easy for everyone and people stop complaining, but what's in it for this person? So for our CEO, it's really all about we're going to save money and make more. Do, don't you want that? For our applications team, it was all about, hey, I can make your job way easier. For the buying team, it'd be less issues to deal with on the back end. So it was really meeting people where they were and championing that for them versus like my big idea. I love that you said that. I, I, I think it's the one place that we fall short because we were thinking about what's in it for us. So we, we miss that completely. Um, and I think the other thing you said in there that's really important for us on Launch Street to pay attention to is, you know, you talked about kind of the soft nudges. And I know I'm guilty of this. I have a big vision. Then I go to the team and I'm like, hey, guys, here's what we're going to do. And the look on their faces is, oh, my God, that's more work for me. And I have to change how I'm doing things. I just figured out how to do the last idea you had. So I, I think the thing, funny thing about change, I find, is that people don't fear change itself, but they fear being changed. And when we push shit on them, that's what happens. Um, so, uh, yeah, so it's interesting you said that. Now, I have a lot of questions for you. So I'm, I could keep going on micro changes and nudges because I think that's such an important lesson. I hope we all listen to that. But I want to ask you about something you wrote in a blog that I, after I read the couple sentences, I actually had to stop and think about my own experience for, for a minute. Um, and you said, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but you basically said that with every promotion, every salary, basically every ladder you were climbing up, your effectiveness to do your own job decreased. So salary and responsibility and I guess status, right, increased, but your effectiveness and I'm guessing motivation decreased. Will you tell me more about that? Because that, that really sunk in with me. Yes, yes, yes. You would think it'd be the opposite. <laughs> right. But it's not. So one of the things that was true for me, and it's true for many of my clients now, is that as I was growing and getting up the ladder, I really didn't understand what leading and managing a team meant. And what tends to happen quite often is that when someone is proficient at their job and they can really execute a function well, they, they tend to get elevated, which makes sense on the surface. And it certainly made sense for me. I was really good at my job and I had been doing it for a while and it made sense that I would you know, manage other people and help other people do it too. But the thing that isn't usually explicitly clear when you're growing in your role and whether it's like you're going from a director to a vice president or a VP to a C-suite, it happens in every tier. What really doesn't get clarified is, okay, what part of your job are you leaving behind? so that you can take on more capacity to do what's required for you to step into the new role. And for me, as I was growing, uh, I really hunkered down and did more of the things I was good at because I thought that's what people wanted. So I kept actually like hoarding the processes that I was good at. So I would do more of the like visual merchandising, more of the marketing, more of the branding, be in every single meeting. And what that did is it hurt my ability to be effective because I was too in the details and not in the big picture. And uh, on top of that, this happens often with managers too, is they hoard a lot of the work and they don't delegate. And maybe they delegate a little bit of a process, but they don't really empower the person beneath them or the teams you know, that they're managing to really take on a full function. And what they end up doing is they cannibalize that team or that person's ability to grow. 
So what I had was a team who's super qualified, who had me like in every single meeting and every single process. Bottlenecking all of them. Yeah, bottlenecking everything. And then on top of that, me exhausted, couldn't make it to everything, couldn't get to every single email, working like lots and lots of hours a week and unhappy and actually then getting, you know, performance reviews back that said, Hey, we need you to be more attentive. We need you to speak up more. We need you to show up more. And I was like, how much more can I possibly do? What do you mean? I'm doing everything. And so I missed the big joke, right? The big joke is that leading and managing are two different things. Yeah. Managing is really all about, you know, owning a function and making sure that function is executed well and people beneath you can do it well. And then leading is really about inspiring and having a vision and charting a course for your team and supporting the company in whatever course they're trying to chart. And so I got a rude awakening. You know, I was fortunately or unfortunately selected to do a 360. Um, and I've done that. It's (laughs) eye-opening. Yes. I was like, oh, my first response is I'm going to (laughs) quit. Uh, and in the 360, I got all this feedback where I was like, I was blown away what pe- how people were perceiving me. And it really was the moment that I realized I have to change something here because this is, this is not working. Uh, leaders really need to be the ones spearheading the vision and they have to be taught how to let go of the things that they really feel good about doing in the business. Because when you're stepping into that leadership role, it's scary. We do, like who teaches you how to influence and inspire people? Like, I don't know what class that is. I haven't taken it, right? Like who teaches you how to like motivate and like deal with conflict and have hard conversations and, you know, manage up like that. That doesn't really you learn that kind of on the job. And so it makes sense that people would kind of retract and stay focused and hunker down in the tasks that make them feel really good and where they feel the most productive. So I think, you know, if I hear you right, um, and I've been in this position myself, and I've done the 360, and for those of you uh, listening who haven't done or don't know it, it's basically where you are reviewed, not just by the people who manage you, your leaders, but your peers and the people who work for you. It's everybody. So at all different levels. And it's fascinating. Um, And I actually just, in (laughs) since you shared yours, I'll just tell you that I got one once that said, um, she seems to care about herself more than others. (laughs) So I had that same, and I was like, what are you talking, like, I love my team. What? So it was, a, again, and I, like you said, an eye opener, but I think what's, what's important here about what you're saying is doing and leading are two different things. And we often uh, promote people in particularly in larger companies for being do- good doers. And then we leave them high and dry when they become leaders. And then we expect them to have leadership skills baked in where really you have to teach people. Not everybody is innately a great leader. And even the ones who are innately good still need help to get to the next level, but we don't, we leave people hanging. So no wonder you held on to what you knew what to do. What else are you going to do? You didn't know the other stuff. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And it's a very, it's a common issue. Uh, I see it with my clients. It's common. They, they really, they get into a role and all of a sudden they're just, ta-da, you're promoted and good luck. And they still have to figure out how to do their job plus expand their capacity and manage up and, you know, deal with new leadership and uh, deal with different cross-functional partners. And they're left going, I'm just stuck. And I have no idea how to manage all of this. Uh, And it's something that I think corporations can do a better job at when it comes to uh, succession planning. It, yeah. There really is a, a training that's required to get people into that role. Because for yeah. example, you know, I, my experience of I want to quit is not a rare experience. Most people go, you know what? I don't know if I want this job anymore. I don't know if I want mm-hmm. to stay in this. Um, it's natural to not want to fail, right? So it makes sense. Well, and especially if you don't have the answers. And, and I would venture to say that the side effect of all of that is then you have teams that are not working optimally. They're not innovating. They're not collaborating um, because you've got this bottleneck at the top that doesn't know how to lead them and provide them the vision. And I was just reading um, Nine Lies at Work. I don't know if you've read it yet by Buckingham. No, I have not. It's great. But one of the things he was talking about in the very beginning is people don't stay at companies for the company. Like it doesn't matter how much free time you give people and and like organic food and cafeteria. It's the teams. So if if there's a bottleneck at the top, then... (laughs) The team is in trouble, and that's why people stay or go um, at companies. So I want to flip it and talk a little bit about, because you have a lot of tools for how you get to that good place of leadership and success. So um, how does having a dream for your career, instead of just going through the motions, how does, well, I should say differently, why does that matter 
why does that matter? Especially as you move in, I think, to what we were just talking about, which is the more leadership roles. Yes. Okay. So uh, most of us, and not all, but most, uh, really have an idea for where they want to be in their career or in their life for that matter by a certain age or a certain milestone. And, you know, we usually set out on that course and we think, you know, it's going to take some time, but if we do all the right things, one foot in front of the other, we will end up there. And what ends up happening is life, right? Companies lose leadership, restructures happen, uh, we have our own personal life changes, and oftentimes, and you can hear how I'm going to talk about this, we find ourselves in a position. So like, ta-da, I'm here as a VP managing this team, not really loving doing this. We find right. ourselves in these positions where, you know, we're like, okay, I'm here, I don't feel really excited. I'm not necessarily thrilled, but I have that title that everybody wants and I'm making a great paycheck, so I should be good, right? And we, don't, we almost don't question it. We really just kind of go, okay, this is the next step in the chain, here's where I am. And unfortunately, what that leads to is less employee engagement. Uh, people end up getting very bored. They're not really inspired by their job, so they get bored. And, uh, you know, if you ever watch, you know, children who are bored, uh, they love to, like, complain and, like, nag you. Like, <laughs> yeah, that's where the toxic culture starts. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. then all the gossiping happens, and then they love to make messes, right? So mm. when people are in their careers and just following the motions and the steps, they can end up in these places, which really hurt, obviously, uh, the company culture and causes uh, – turnover and gossip starts to happen, silos start to occur, and a whole slew of other things. So the reason why it's important to have a dream is because in the dream you get to tell the truth about exactly what it is that you want. And look, we use at Handel the word dream because it's a little yummier, it's a little nicer and more inspiring than my goals. Uh, something like bigger to hang your hat on, There's like it's purposeful. But in addition to it being purposeful, a dream is really inclusive about of all that you want to experience, accomplish, and acquire in an area. So it's really not just about that one thing, like, you know, roll out that project or promote this team member. It's really about the holistic vision. And when we get people connected to their dreams and when we get them to tell the truth about what it is that they want, what comes out is, oh, you know what? I don't care so much about moving up. Like some people don't really want to lead that big team. They're really happy staying in their role uh, and maybe being an individual contributor for the rest of their career. Uh, or other people really consider that, you know what, I just like my little niche and they want to be, become a specialist. And one of like the biggest issues that we see in companies and as people start to grow and it makes sense for them to move to the next leadership position is they have to go up. And some people don't want to go up, and in some companies, going up can take a long period of time, which then can leave employees deflated because they don't feel like there's any mobility. So when we get people to dream, what we really get them connected to is, you know what, you can design something, you can create something that doesn't mean just going up, you could go across, you can create breath in your role. This often happens with people who've been in their position for like 20 years, you know, they're really happy in their title, the organization is rather flat, and you know, they don't want to go up, or their boss is there, and they, when, when they transition out, they're not looking to take on that next big job. Instead, they want to stay where they are, so the conversation becomes, what could you dream up? if you can create breath in your role. And most often they come back with, I would mentor, I would start to do things with sustainability or uh, a particular population that I care about, whether it's diversity or women in leadership. And so they start to make an impact on the organization in ways that are profound but have nothing to do with moving up, all because they started to dream, all because they started to ask themselves the question of what, like, what else is possible for me if I don't have to do the next step in the rung. Will you give me an example of um, either one of your clients or a, like a represent, representative story of your clients, kind of an example of a dream? Because I hear what you're saying about sometimes we get stuck in goals and goals are very finite and not, to your point, they're just not that juicy. So mm -hmm. what, what would a dream look like? Okay, so a dream is 
it's almost like the best way I can describe it. It's like your mission statement for the next year or two. So whenever we have clients create a dream, we have them look at, okay, if we can fast forward to the end of next year or in the end of like two years from now, what would you be proud to say that you accomplished? That's the first question I ask them because we really do measure our life by the things that we've checked off our to-do list. Yeah, and we check off like the list of like I wish I could do that. So the first thing I have them do is real is our is articulate that. The second thing, and what's so interesting is when you ask people how they're doing or how their job is going, one of the very first things that they say is how they feel, the experience that they're having. And but what's so fascinating is when you ask people what they want to accomplish, we rarely say what experience we want to have. We rarely say I want to feel proud about this or connected to this team, or um you know, efficient at something. So I have them go tell me, like, how do you want to feel at the end of this all? What would be your experience of yourself and those around you? And from that place, we have them start to craft exactly what it is that they want. Um, Each dream sounds a little different, but what I will say is that it's always written in the present tense so that you are actively working on producing it now. There is a combination of head and heart meaning that the dream has like facts and figures in it, things that your head can really kind of sink its teeth into, if you will, like hard facts. We know we can go produce this, so it's not so pie in the sky. Uh, And then your heart. And your heart really is the things that you most care about, your values, your highest ideals. And usually what it means to have your heart in a dream above and beyond having your values and ideals there is that it's written in a tone that you can relate to. And, uh, you know, Often my clients will give me a, a dream that sounds like a job description. And I'm like, I don't think you feel really inspired by this. <laughs> no job like, description is that inspiring. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's really like, you know, it's very much like I lead a team. The team is really right. happy. You know, we made the goal for the year. Wah, wah, wah. And the truth is the best way to get yourself connected to the dream is to write it in your tone. So whether that means you have sarcasm, you're funny, you swear, whatever it is, you put it in your tone so that you can really believe it. The point of writing the dream is to be clear, not only on where you want to go and to really kind of like noodle through, is it up, is it down, is it across, but to also have something that despite those external obstacles, because they will come, the people who don't believe in you, as we talked about earlier, the things that uh, yeah, come around, come in your way. And then also the, in, the internal obstacles where you go doubt yourself, where you're not sure that you can produce on something. The dream is there so that when you have those obstacles come your way, you're able to go back to it and go, oh, yes, this is what I'm doing it all for. Like, I really want this. So I love that. And what's interesting about it is the exercise I, I want to do next when we get off this call is design your dream and to see... And just to kind of see what comes out, but it's funny, I'm actually sitting here at my desk and we don't have time to make this a personal, personal coaching session, but I wrote down what's funny is goals for the year. My team and I have just been going through them, but they're very heart and head. Like I have steady cash flow of X per month, but I also have things like, um, I really want to lead the way and change the conversation around innovation and make it more human centered versus like process and culture and like high concept centered. And I really want our team, the launch street team to, to achieve our personal human potential, meaning be stronger, smarter, happier human. So I think I'm headed in the right direction, but I, I appreciate what you're saying about it being head and heart. And I think for all of us on launch street, I think our next challenge or our next exercise should be to design our dreams and kind of see what would happen if we did what Krista is saying and do head and heart together versus just bullet points of job description, because you're right, that's not motivating and it's not real. That's not what we're thinking about on a day-to-day basis, even if we're not being conscious about it. So the, the next thing I wanted to ask you about is um, power shifting. Mm -hmm. So walk me through that. Mm -hmm. So the concept of power shifting has all to do with how you view yourself, how you relate to yourself and then how you relate to others in the world. So for anyone who is up to designing a new dream, who wants to carve out a different path in an organization or wants to innovate something, bring to fruition something that doesn't exist, there really is always going to be, the minute we take on a risk, that little voice inside your head that I really wish I can find a pill that makes it shut up, um, <laughs> that, no it, <laughs> that will just start you know, nagging at you. Inherently, whenever humans take risk, our voice of fear pops up. 
And in coaching, we use funny words to make people deal with the various ways our brain tries to take us out and sabotage us. So we call the voice of fear your chicken. And your chicken, right? Quack, quack, quack. Um, your chicken is the voice of, you know, don't fail, don't mess up, don't look stupid, right? Like, you know, they don't like you. Uh, it's the voice of self-doubt and self-deprecation. And whenever you're put in a position where you have to go take on something big, this is going to start becoming really loud. And the power shift is all about you being able to identify that voice and realize when you are turning yourself into what we would say a two. So the idea here is that you really can show up in the world in one of two ways. You can be a one, which is you being present to the value that you add into the world. You know your worth, you know the contribution, the contribution that you can make, and you proudly stand in what um, your talents are. Another way of saying of being a one is that you're present to who you are. And what happens when you're being a one and present to who you are is that you put that out into the world and you really project, I am, I am this. And there is no apology about it. There isn't a belief that you're perfect in any way, but there really is like, this is who I am. This is the value I can, I can give you. This is what I can cause and create. I believe in this. There's conviction. And when you put I am out into the world, what happens is people mirror it back to you and they confirm you are by the way they treat you, by the way they communicate with you, by what they give you, by how much they're willing to negotiate with you. They project back to you, you are, because you're not wavering in your presence. Now, when you listen to that chicken, that voice of fear, and it's like taking you out and making you think you're less than or not good enough or shouldn't, you know, don't know enough, imposter syndrome, very common here. When you are listening to that, what can happen is you bring yourself down to a two. And a two is being less than. Sometimes even when, when some of us get into a two, instead of really dealing with those feelings of being a two, we try to make other people less than us. Like we're like, no, yeah, you suck. Yeah. We project it out. Yeah, exactly. So it could be you making yourself a two or someone else a two, but regardless, two is happening. When you're being a one in the world, when you're present to who you are, you see every else, everyone else is one. Like you don't see people as a two because there's no competition. There's no comparison. You're just really present to your value and you're focused on that, not on other people. The minute you're focused on like that person's better than me or is more qualified, you're twoing yourself and or you're twoing them. And so what happens when you're a two is you start to question, like, can I do this? Is it possible? Do I have the qualifications? And you're really in the conversation of, of am I? So now you've gone from I am to am I. And when you project am I out into the world, people project back, are you? All in how they treat you, all in how they relate to you, and all in like their ability to negotiate with you and give you what you want. So power shifting is a powerful, it's a perspective and a, and a tool to use to shift your thinking and really get yourself to go, where am I going and looking at myself as a two? In those places, I cannot be effective. If I'm too busy questioning my value, my worth, I can't champion the things that I want to go champion. The shift has to happen. It's an internal shift. I always like to tell my clients, um, it's an internal shift. Nothing that somebody can do in the external world can make you feel like a one. It has to happen internally. So no amount of promotion, salary increases, people championing your ideas will shift how you feel about yourself and how you view yourself in the world. You have to take that out internally. And it comes from really getting that all you're doing when you're making yourself a two, when you start going into am I, is you're just listening to that voice of fear and believing it and actually like rooting for it versus listening to the voice of your dreams and, and coaching what we would say your author, which is that like voice who really wants you to get up out of bed when it's raining and go running um, and like really wants you to go have the conversation with your boss. Uh, when you're listening to that voice, you're being the one. So let me ask you a question about this. And by the way, I call my chicken Bernard. Mm. Something about, for me, there's something about he's he's like a little little lizard with wispy hair and big glasses, uh -huh. and like he he's yeah. like kind of just kind of meek in his demeanor in his little lizard uh -huh. way. Yeah. <laughs> and he sits yeah, on my shoulder, and I'm like, "We're no Bernard, not today." 
But um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it happens to all of us. And the reason I think I really wanted to dig into this with you that I think it's so important is especially when you're trying to push change and innovation, even if that's in a, a micro, micro way, like we talked about earlier, or in a big way. I think you gotta be really, you gotta stand tall when you do that, um, because yeah. the minute you waver you it's like showing defeat before you've even got you know gotten the idea for it i kind of equate it to sometimes i'll judge weightlifting competitions just like casual mm-hmm. ones not like anything serious but sometimes people will know they didn't make the lift and halfway through the lift they're like oh like you see it on their face and i always laugh because i say to them just pretend like you made it i might not have noticed the mistake like why are you already showing defeat i haven't even put my paddle up to tell you if it was a good lift or not and it's kind of yeah. this running joke, but the same is true in work. We, we accept defeat before we've even gotten our foot in the door. So yes. if I, I'm in that mode where I'm listening to my chicken, how do, I, how do I shift? And maybe there's two ways to ask this question. And way one is like what I'm by myself and what I can do. And way two is in the moment when I'm giving that presentation, I'm asking for some resources for this great new idea that I know is going to be the solution of the year, but I feel it creeping in. What do I do? Right. Okay. So the first thing is that you're always going to experience your chicken. It's always going to come up. Whenever we take on risk or we have the opportunity to be rejected in some way, when we're being vulnerable, putting ourselves out there, we are, the chicken's going to pop up. The chicken is the voice of um, self-preservation, right? It wants Mm -hmm. to keep you safe. Yeah. And it's your lizard brain. You can't get yes, rid of it. Exactly. It's total crock brain, right? It's, you know, instinct and desire. And the first thing we want to do is run away and like, please get me out of this room. Even though we really believe in something, like, please get me out of here. And we prefer to reject ourselves first, like take a, ourselves down. Like you suck. So you don't have the conversation before someone mm. else can say it to us. Right. So that's mm. kind of our right. goal. Like, what out. Fascinating. So yeah. We're so hard on ourselves. So hard on ourselves, exactly. And it's funny. It's funny that we're so hard on ourselves. Uh, and I say funny, it's just like, really? Like, wow, I take myself out like that all the time. And then we have the experience when you're sitting in a room and someone's saying something, you're like, um, I can do that. I'm, I'm capable. I had that idea three months ago. Like, how come I didn't say something, right? Because we take ourselves out. And then what that does is it silences us. And we, we, we put muzzles on our faces. Um, so the, the first thing is to deal with your chicken is to really get, and when you see yourself dropping into that two, questioning who you are, being in the space of am I, is to get that when that happens, it's completely natural. So I find for my clients that if I can get them to go, oh, I expected that to happen and to have a strategy for how to do, deal with it when it happens, that it takes away the edge. We're not kind of surprised. So one of the exercises I do with my clients is I have them identify how does your chicken talk to you? And everyone has a little bit of a different way that their chicken talks to them. Some of my clients really have the, you know, kind of like beratement, you suck, you're not good Mm -hmm. enough, get out of here kind of chicken. Other clients have this almost like, woe is me, like no one ever listens to me. I can't get anything across. It's not me, it's them. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Like double-aiming, martyr um, kind of voice. So you want to identify what is the voice of your chicken? And, you know, I, I give them the exercise of just like chronicling, you know, what I call a thought log. Just like make a list of all the times you heard your voice of fear today. And then you'll start to notice a, a theme and a trend for how your chicken talks to you. And then what we do is we have them actually come up with a talk back. So what, what is the way you're going to talk back to that particular thought? So it's like a re-scripting and a reframing. So if the, the thought is, okay, you know what? No one takes me seriously. And that's something I struggle with. That's actual personal one for me. Like, no one takes me seriously. No one listens to me. Uh, My talk back to that is, okay, makes sense why you'd be scared about that. It's happened in the past. But guess what? You have something really important to say. Are you not willing to say it now? And when I ask myself that question, I'm like, no, I want to say it. Okay. (laughs) Now what I've done is I've had a dialogue with, like, the part of my brain that I usually don't challenge. And most of us don't challenge it because it is, as you said, the lizard brain, the, the very, you know, early part of our brain that has us acting on instinct and desire. And so now when I start to challenge it and I start to like actually question it, what, what it does is it allows me to become resourceful and it allows me to figure out a way to make connections and move through it versus just, you know, believing it at face value. 
You know, what I like about what you're saying too is, so first of all, I love this difference between I am and am I. Like mm-hmm. what a great, what an easy way to just frame up the two different places you come from. But what yes. I really like about what you're saying is it puts the uh, control back in, back in, back to me. So instead mm-hmm. of my thoughts controlling me, I get to control my thoughts. And someone once said to me, uh, the funny thing about thoughts is you still have the choice to agree with them or disagree with them. They're not mm-hmm. true just because you thought it. I was like, oh. Yes, yes. We oftentimes, you know, believe that every, that our logic is real. Uh, yeah, but, but it's really, not. it's not. <laughs> it's really not. And if you actually took a moment to like, hear what you were saying to yourself, you'd be fast, you'd be fascinated. Uh, in fact, I often tell my clients when they're stuck on something and they can't get past how to deal, I have them do this assignment called a purge, which is basically put all your negative thoughts on paper and then go read them. And it's fascinating what comes out. <laughs> and you're like, whoa. And the truth is every thought that you have allows you to take an action in accordance with that thought. And then we have you know, the action, the thought plus the action equals the results we see in our reality. So it's no wonder, if you think about it, most of our inner dialogue, most of the thoughts we have are negative. There's like some studies out there that say it's up to like 80% negative. And what negative means is not necessarily all bad, like that person hates me, uh, but negative can mean things like, oh, I'm not good enough for that job. Or, you know, I horrible speaking up at meetings. Negative really is, thoughts or our thoughts that are not congruent with the results that you want to go see. And if you really took a step back, most of the time when we're talking to ourselves, it's not us supporting or championing any dreams. It's really about keeping us small and exactly where we are today. Well, I really like this idea of talking back. I mean, I talk to Bernard all the time. So, um, but I I'm sure the conversations <laughs> are wonderful. <laughs> well, I think, well, it's unfortunate about it is it often happens in a public place. Like it's later when I'm having this conversation with myself, you know, not always in the moment. And it's in the mm-hmm. grocery store and I'm walking down the aisle and I'm, you know, something like every now and again, it goes from my head to my mouth as someone's walking past me. And I'm like, oh, sorry, yes. that was. <laughs> my bad. Um, but but it is interesting to me. And, and so my question back to you with this is with the power shifting and the dream, how do you think that helps you be a stronger leader and innovator? Yes. So the people in organizations and the people who in their life really take on this approach that the pen is in their hand. They're the author, they're the ones really scripting the story, they're empowered, and they're accountable for both what's working and not working. It's like, you know, being an author, dreaming, power shifting, it's not about being perfect, like no one's advocating for that. We will self-doubt, it's natural, we will um, waver, we will get scared. Uh, But the people who really practice and consistently make themselves go back to the table and take on a willingness to show up as the best versions of themselves, make the biggest ripples in organizations and in their life. And the reason is because they don't get so stuck in the am I conversation. Like, am I good enough? Am I this? We waste a lot of time in this conversation. And we can miss the boat on an opportunity to speak up about something. Uh, We can miss the boat on an opportunity to bring something into the universe and try something just because we don't think we have the right qualifications or the right network or the right resource. And the, the being stuck in this MI conversation keeps you focused on all the things that you cannot do and all the resources you do not have. The minute you shift the perspective to I am and to your dream, the thing that you most care about, your highest values and ideals, what you're really focused on is, okay, how do I make this path forward? And those people, they don't look at the issues. They look at the opportunities. And they look at the fact we just downsized an opportunity to carve out a new department versus as as an opportunity to hunker down and don't say anything because I don't want anyone to kick me out next, right? They look at, okay, you know, there's this disruptor that's coming into an industry and instead of like, you know, doing more of what we've always done, they go, hey, maybe we can partner with them. Like they really do look at these at, at these opportunities that come along the marketplace from the perspective of what can I innovate? Because in being the author, in being the person who's got the pen in your hand, really willing to take on your dreams and willing to you know step up to the places that you know you can step up, step up into, is that they are in a constant state of inventing and innovating, never you know, stuck think- in the 
the current reality. I think there's a big, important personal point in what you're saying. And, you know, oftentimes, I'm sure you see this with your clients. I see this all across the globe where people are so afraid of the change happening in their industries and we're all dealing with it. I mean, there's massive change happening. The, the rate of change is, is, the speed is increasing. You know, AI is taking over some people's jobs. The, the playing field is way more competitive than it's ever been before. I mean, there's, there's a million things happening that are causing us to kind of stay up at night um, as leaders, as employees, as entrepreneurs. But what I'm hearing you say that I think is so important for us to really pay attention to is when you get to that space of, I am and have that dream and own who you are as an innovator, you actually get to see that change as an opportunity to do something and you get to harness it because the reality is the change always existed and always will. But, but what really matters is our ability to take those pieces of the puzzle and just put it together in a different way. And I think when people realize that, at least what I've seen is it's, it's a really transformative moment for them of like, Oh, hold on, I don't have to fear all this stuff happening around me. I can actually use it to my advantage. I just have to think a little differently. Yeah, the, the way that um, fear takes people out is it has you thinking. Like the logic behind fear yeah. has you thinking that if you, know, if you wait, it'll be better tomorrow. Um, yeah. it's the time Never that true. You, right? You don't have the resources. Like you know, having that conversation with that person, it's better on Monday. Right, some oh, version yeah. of Monday is always there, always there. But then, <laughs> always off, the like, diet. You know Wednesday. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The diet, like that's Monday, right? It's always like right, always Monday. <laughs> I'm planning today, tomorrow. Also. Yeah, exactly. Right. So it has you believing that if you punt it, if you kick the can down the road, it'll be better. Then you'll have more resources. You'll be more prepared. And really, that's just bullshit logic. It really is. Yeah. Um, the moment in most instances is now it's it, to act is now to start taking one step as we talked about earlier even if it's a micro step towards something the moment really is now and the more that we buy into tomorrow is better it'll it'll make more sense I'll be more prepared there'll be more resources the more we lose out on opportunities to innovate in big and yeah. small ways and the more behind we get because now we got to yeah. catch up not one day but three days or ten days or <laughs> a year or whatever um, I want to bring it in yeah. Oh, I just want to say one thing. It happens yeah. often in companies where they wait, right? Where they just kind of wait to take on. And then they, they find themselves in the marketplace so far behind and antiquated in their technology and their process and the way that they run their culture. And there's so many um, byproducts of that. And, you know, most companies, when they have to go start innovating, like in after they've kind of decided to not do it for so long because they were scared of the change or weren't ready yet or weren't prepared, they find themselves in really big trouble. And you know, as people are really trying to like get talent and there's this war on talent to find good people, those companies in particular find themselves in a position where they can't retain people, which really yeah. hurts their yeah, you know, we could probably have a whole another podcast talking about that. And when you look at the life cycle of businesses, which are getting shorter and shorter, um, the challenge is I think companies and le the leaders in the company, because today it's a people, it's people making decisions. They rest on their success too long and then they hit the cliff. And, um, you know, that success, that pond that they're going to get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until they have to do something about it. To your point, they're kind of like, tomorrow we'll do it. It's fine today. Tomorrow we'll do it. It's fine today. Tomorrow we'll do it. And then by the time they do it, they've hit a cliff. And yes. to, to shift gears at a cliff is a lot harder than to shift gears when you're on kind of like some kind of trajectory of some kind. So um, I want to shift gears for a second and bring it back to you and how you innovate. We were talking about this offline a little bit because um, you took the assessment to find out what type of everyday innovator you are. And yeah. um, your, yours is risk taker inquisitive. So we have an overlapping risk taker. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm hearing it in your, in your kind of conversation and particularly on the risk taker side about like being willing to be uncomfortable and speaking up. Cause that's really what risk taker and innovation is really about. It's about innovating in those uncomfortable spaces, not being careless and like impulsive, but really being willing to leap a little bit further than most. And the inquisitive is all about digging deep and innovation and the questions, not the answers. Um, which I love because inquisitives are so good at asking and challenging assumptions because people like you are like, well, why does it have to be like that? Which is kind of what you were saying actually with your opening story about like, well, why can't we just change the process if it's not working? Um, how do you, when you think about how you innovate, how do you think that's helped or, or pushed you forward in your work? Ooh, very good question. Uh, so 
One of the things that I make sure I do on a daily basis is to take a bold action. It's actually a like, like an assignment I'll give my clients to do. And bold action, you know, could be something small, uh, like talking to the barista at Starbucks if I happen to yeah. be an introvert. Example, or it could be something larger, like actually. Uh, there going, are some days that is a very bold action for me. <laughs> exactly. Yes. So you're like everybody, leave me alone today. Yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, for me, one of the things that I have really done to evolve my chicken because I really truly am afraid of my shadow, like yeah. terrified of it, uh, and I prefer to stay small and I hate risks. Um, it really, truly, like when I think about taking a risk, it scares me. But what's that's true about my like chicken, my my brain. It's all instinctual. But the the truth of who I am as an author and a designer, and when it comes to all my dreaming, is that I want big things and I want to really improve and change the world, and I want to make people's lives better. So for me, it really is about taking that daily bold action. And sometimes the bold action is just being a little vulnerable and telling people that you're scared. Sometimes the bold action is sharing your story and being humble about where you've messed up and made mistakes. And that has helped me because when I am working with my clients, most people don't want to share those things. They don't want to say where they're not great. They don't want to own their abilities. And when I get to do that, when I get to be honest and really, truly brave in that way, because, you know, going to a client and sharing where you're not great, where you messed up, where you forgot to send the email, whatever it might be, uh, puts you in a position where they might reject you. But what I found over time is whenever I've done that, it's caused a deeper connection. Uh, It's mostly caused clients for life. And also it's allowed people to open up to me so that I can really impact them. And for me in the current work that I do in coaching, I have to innovate through others. People come to me with like what they want to go cause in their life. And then I have to figure out the vision. I have to really support them and going, okay, here's the roadmap we're going to go take. And I have to believe in that and believe in it for them. And in order to do that, there really has to be a level of pure vulnerability with people. So that's how I would say it's about taking those bold actions. And sometimes it is like, you know, looking a fool, embarrassing yourself. And other times it's really about just like showing your heart to people and being honest about our common experiences as humans. I mean, we could have a whole podcast on the importance, I think, of vulnerability and what it actually does to drive innovation. But we're out of time. The one thing I do want to say about what you just said that I, I... really took to heart, as you said, it was, especially as a risk taker as well, because everyone thinks that we're just always willing to like, take the leap all the time. But, but that is our true self. But to all of us, and whatever our styles are, I think the chicken talks you out of your natural innovation strengths, and a lot of your strengths in general, like the chickens there to try to talk you out of it, even though it's actually you. And that's the funny thing about the mind, I think, and the tricks that it plays on us in the modern world, you know, so um, before we run out of time, where can people go to learn more and connect with you? Yes. So you can, your, or your listeners can go to handelgroup.com to learn more about the company and what we do. Uh, Handel Group is an executive life coaching company. So we do both executive coaching. We work in corporations, uh, teams uh, in the C-suite, as well as with individuals in all areas of life. So you can check out Handel Group. You can follow me on LinkedIn. And then if you're interested, uh, if any of your listeners are interested in understanding more about what we do with clients, we have a new digital platform called InnerU where people can go and buy the platform and basically have a learner-led experience around dreaming, dealing with their chicken, figuring out how to be a one. And um, in that platform, we also provide uh, coaching support. So for someone who's like, you know what, I might be up to a new dream. I recommend that they check it out. This has been so great, Krista. So what's your final piece of advice for innovators on Launch Street? The final piece of advice is that if you are not clear on a dream and have an idea for where you want to go to really get clear on it, it really is a thing that sets apart leaders in industry and gets people really connected to the things that they want to go create. So for those who are out there in the world wanting to make big ripples, shift how we do things, disrupt an industry. It's really important to get clear, not just on the thing that you want to accomplish in the next six months, but really the overall vision and how it's going to impact you and society as a whole. 
Oh my gosh, Krista, that is a great place to end. Thank you so much. I have I have so many to do's coming out of this podcast, which is, Yay! in my opinion, like the mark of a great podcast. So thank you. <laughs> awesome. Thank you for your time. It was lovely chatting with you. Thanks for hanging with us on Inside Launch Street. If you know someone that is truly ready to unlock their innovation advantage, have them join you on Launch Street. Discover your innovation advantage. Build a team of high-performing innovators and ignite ideas and solutions that create massive impact. G-O-T-O, LaunchStreet.com. Remember, innovators, if you don't take the leap, somebody else will.